Okay. Maybe. Okay. Welcome back. Uh, let's start this session. And the first speaker is Savannah Garmon from Osaka. And this is the title of their cover talk. Okay. So uh, I will talk about the uh, measuring the non exponential decay at the bound state in continuum. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, I start with a kind of definition. So bound states in continuum represent localized states that uh, counterintuitively reside directly in the energy continuum that's usually associated with scattering states that are delocalized. So now these, uh, these bound states in continuum, or BICs, they appear due to interference effects in, in quantum mechanics. So essentially what happens is, the, is the, this, uh, uh, this element of the discrete sector of the system becomes uh, decoupled from the continuum. So that's why it could reside in the continuum. Um, so although these were first predicted in 1929 by von Neumann and Wigner, uh, yet they still haven't been, let's say, unambiguously detected in quantum systems yet. Uh, but note that uh, according to this definition, the, the bound states in continuum can only appear in open quantum system, that is systems that have both discrete energies as well as uh, an energy continuum. Uh, where the energy continuum is generally associated uh, with some kind of environmental influence on the discrete part of the system. So here, what I've, I've just drawn a simple kind of abstract idea of a one-dimensional open quantum system. So here we have some kind of discrete system, some atoms or some molecules or something, uh, and they are somehow interacting with some kind of environment. So the environment is then associated with the energy continuum here. Uh, and then uh, the interaction between these two systems can result in uh, a myriad thing, uh, a myriad of things that can happen. So uh, in, our, in our solutions uh, for the, for the uh, eigenvalue spectrum, we can have solutions that are like a bound state, which is exponentially localized in the discrete region. Uh, but we can also have uh, resonance. Oh, uh, sorry, I should emphasize. So the, the energy of the bound state appears outside of the continuum. Um, we can also have resonance states, uh, where resonance states um, represent some kind of balance between uh, the discrete sector, the properties of the discrete sector, and those of the environment. Okay, And it represents... Uh, something like an outgoing property into the environment and associated with exponential decay. And this, this uh, object has a complex eigenvalue where the imaginary part of the eigenvalue uh, uh, gives the decay width, uh, which describes the exponential decay. Okay. And now as a special case, as a special case of the resonant state, what can happen when we have this perfect quantum interference uh, effect, uh, what happens is that uh, the imaginary part of the resonance eigenvalue vanishes. And that's when you have this bound state and continuum eigenvalue that appears directly in the continuum. And uh, yes, yeah, so uh, uh, the eigenstate for that state looks like it has, it has support in the discrete sector, uh, but then due to the interference, it basically decouples from the environmental region. It just vanishes uh, in that region. So, uh, like I said, there, while we don't yet have a kind of unambiguous detection in a quantum system, uh, quite recently they have been observed in these kind of optical waveguide array experiments uh, that, um, that uh, often use, uh, function as a very useful analogy for, for true quantum systems. Um, so, uh, as an example, uh, there, there's at least one other experiment, but uh, this experiment by Wyman et al., uh, what they do is they construct this uh, uh, semi-infinite uh, waveguide array. Uh, and by semi-infinite, I mean there's a, a very large number of elements uh, to, the, to the left uh, side of the screen. Um, and 
Uh, yeah, and so what can happen is you can have a photonic excitation in one waveguide, for example, and then it can excite its neighboring waveguide. And in that way, you can have uh, tunneling or, or an excitation that travels from, uh, from one element to the nearest neighbor. And uh, um, so then uh, they introduce into this a, uh, a side attached uh, kind of extra element into the array. And so this side attached element, basically it defines sort of the defect side of the, of the, of the system. And um, yeah, and then, so the BIC mode, the BIC mode then appears as a, uh, as a special case as you tune, as you carefully tune the uh, couplings uh, to, the, to the, the side attached or impurity element uh, of the array, uh, as well as these couplings here. And so uh, in their experiment for this case here, um, they observed both the ordinary bound states, the exponentially localized states, as well as the bound stating continuums. Uh, so uh, here you can see what they have is uh, not a true continuum because ultimately the number of waveguides is large but finite. Uh, but you have a quasi-continuum here, and then uh, they observe an exponentially localized uh, bound state here, which is just localized in the impurity element. Uh, and that energy, of course, is outside of the continuum. Uh, but then they also observe uh, BIC mode, which here, uh, the energy resides in the continuum. And we notice that this has very specific, you know, phase information coded here among the kind of defect side of the lattice. Okay, and it's, and it's because of that, because of that interference effect, it decouples from the larger array. So then uh, what they do in, the, in this experiment, so they vary, they vary the coupling strength, um, the coupling strength among the uh, semi-infinite portion of the array uh, relative to the couplings on, on, the, uh, on the side. And um, so as they do that, this uh, BIC mode, which is basically decoupled from the larger array, it's unaffected, okay, it's just contained in the waveguides to this side. Uh, however, the defect, mo uh, the defect state or the ordinary bound state here, uh, as, they, as, they increase the, as they increase the coupling, eventually what happens is this exponential localization gets weaker and weaker, and eventually it kind of flatlines, and then uh, this mode delocalizes. Uh, and the delocalization doesn't hold uh, past that point. Um, and just on the other side of that transition, by the way, you have a kind of virtual bound state appears. Uh, this is an anti-localized state, um, which may seem uh, kind of abstract, and I guess it is kind of abstract, but we'll see it has a real influence on the dynamics, so it's important. Okay. So now we've seen that uh, the BICs occur due to interference, have at least been detected in the optical system. So now we propose to apply this recent progress to make progress on another subtle effect, which is deviations from exponential decay in uh, quantum systems. Okay, and so uh, to, to clarify what I mean, let's return to this, to this resonant state that I introduced earlier. So uh, uh, usually when the so-called resonance condition is satisfied, we have exponential decay. So what I mean is we have some kind of continuum here for the environment. We have a discrete level coupled into the continuum. And typically when, the, when the, uh, this uh, energy level is embedded deeply within the continuum, they're kind of comparable, then uh, you typically have this resonance eigenvalue that I mentioned earlier, uh, which leads to, which leads to the complex eigenvalue, uh, which leads to exponential decay described here. And so what this process describes is if we initially occupy this level at time t equals zero, this describes how the system just dissipates into the continuum, okay? However, this is a slightly oversimplified picture because, um, 
because of the existence of a lower threshold on the continuum, which is quite general. Uh, and so it can be shown, uh, like it's been proven in this paper, that it can be shown that the continuum threshold always introduces deviations from exponential decay. Uh, and note, there may also be an upper threshold, or the th continuum could extend to infinity. It just depends on the, the system at hand. Um, so now, in a more detailed picture, what this means is there are deviations from exponential decay that exist uh, at least on extremely short and very long timescales. Okay? So specifically, let's, uh, let's imagine the survival probability for some initially prepared quantum state, psi naught. We prepare the state, we project it to an arbitrary time t, and we project it back onto itself uh, to see what remains time t. And we take the square modulus for the probability. And this is kind of a cartoon picture of what we can expect. Uh, so what we can see is there is a, there is a deviation at short times where we have parabolic decay. Um, and uh, this is also called the Zeno time scale. Uh, then that's followed by the, the dominant exponential decay. And then at very, very long times, what will appear is uh, some deviation which often takes the form of a inverse power law decay. Now, the, and, and I'll mention, so the typical form of this is often a 1 over t cubed law, especially in odd dimensional systems. Um, however, however, so for example, this long time, this long time deviation, it typically does not appear until after 50 or 120 lifetimes of the exponential decay. So typically by that time, the survival probability is so depleted that it's completely impossible to detect this effect. Uh, so that's the typical, typical picture of things. Um, yeah, and so this is just restating that. It's very difficult to detect an experiment. There is one single example of an actual uh, experiment that has shown this effect. Uh, so, but we would like to make it, we would like to make it easier to detect and obviously easier to control the effect, right? Uh, so that's, uh, that's the motivation we come into with this work. So here we propose a new approach to studying the non-exponential decay. Uh, so we start with an initial observation. At the bound state and continuum, obviously, uh, the, this complex eigenvalue becomes real. And obviously, the exponential decay is suppressed. However, that alone does not necessarily help us because obviously the BIC state itself is just, it's just an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. Therefore, it just leads to a stable evolution. There's no decay at all, exponential or otherwise. However, what we propose is simply we will take, uh, we will consider the evolution of a state, oh, sorry, my pointer is kind of dying here, uh, a, a state that lies orthogonal to the BIC. Okay, so we'll look at the evolution of psi orthogonal. And so in this way, uh, in this way, the, the exponential decay is suppressed. However, we avoid the stability associated with the BIC itself. So uh, now our Hamiltonian, uh, we're going to use a slightly simplified variation of the geometry from the experiment that I introduced earlier. So what we have here is, again, we have a semi-infinite array here, uh, described by this term, the, the tight binding model, for those who are familiar with it. Um, and then this is coupled to a side attached, oh, I went too far, a uh, side attached uh, in the impurity element here in blue. Uh, and so that's this term here. And then uh, the variable parameters in the system are the energy in the side attached element here, as well as the coupling to the side attached element. Uh, J describes the coupling along the, the main chain, uh, but we'll just set it equal to one. So these are really the parameters of the system. Uh, okay, so next what we're gonna do is we're going to, uh, we're going to partially diagonalize our system uh, by introducing a half range Fourier transform on the chain. Uh, when we do that, we've diagonalized this tight binding sector of the system for the semi-infinite chain. 
Uh, and it takes this, this well-known form here, uh, and it becomes continuous in the, in the limit of an, imp, well, semi-infinite number of, of elements. Uh, and uh, yeah, and so this takes the, the form of the well-known type binding dispersion, which is a negative cosine. And uh, uh, in this case, we have both a lower threshold and an upper threshold on the continuum at negative 2j and plus 2j, but we're going to set j equal to 1, remember? Uh, and finally, the, uh, the um, uh, coupling term has been modified as such here, and where we've introduced the potential vk sine 2k. Um, and the, you can actually see the bic will appear immediately because uh, it vanishes at uh, k equal pi over 2. So the, you can see the bic will appear here immediately. Uh, in the middle of the band, in fact. So uh, now we can obtain the details for the discrete spectrum for this model from the poles of the Green's function at the impurity site here. Uh, and when we do that, we find it takes the form of 1 over z minus epsilon d minus sigma z. So epsilon d is just the original unperturbed uh, eigenvalue of the, the uh, kind of uh, defect element by itself, uh, and then sigma z is the, um, the self-energy. It basically describes how the continuum uh, influences that impurity element. Yep. Sorry? Short question. Why did you go to Fourier space? Uh, just to diagonalize the, the, uh. the infinite part of the, the infinite chain, or semi-infinite chain. Uh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so it gives us a partially diagonalized system, right? Um, yeah. And so the nice thing is the model can be solved exactly. We get an integrated form for the self-energy function here. Um, and so this is the final form of our discrete dispersion relation for the discrete eigenvalues. Uh, it's equivalent to a fourth order polynomial. Um, and so in the range of typical uh, well, let me say one thing right quick. So uh, you can immediately see the BIC again, because if you just set epsilon d equal to zero, it's obvious there's a solution at z equals zero, right? And that's actually the BIC. Um, so in the range of typical physical values we have in mind uh, uh, here, uh, where we're within the continuum where this resonance condition is satisfied, uh, we have, uh, we'll have two solutions that are either bound states or virtual bound states with the real eigenvalue, or we'll have two solutions that form a resonance anti-resonance pair with complex eigenvalues, complex conjugate eigenvalues. However, for our physical, for our physical system that we have in mind, we can ignore the anti-resonance. It doesn't influence anything. We're just interested in the resonance with the negative uh, imaginary part. Yeah, and so, as I said earlier, if we choose epsilon d equals zero, uh, it's easy to see a solution appears at z equals zero, which is the BIC. And so that's basically this resonant solution as you take the limit epsilon d equals zero, the BIC appears. And so the specific form of the eigenstate, it takes a very simple form, which is part of what makes this, uh, this uh, uh, proposal that we made uh, work, that it's, it's a simple form for this eigenstate. Uh, it just has support uh, in the impurity element as well as the endpoint of the semi-infinite chain. Okay. Now, let's focus, oh, sorry, something messed up here, but let's focus on the spectrum for the case epsilon d equals zero um, uh, as we vary the coupling g. Uh, so that's the case where we have the, where we have the BIC. And uh, so here we have this, the discrete spectrum as a function of, as we change the value of g, as we increase it. And so we can see uh, here, the BIC eigenvalue, it appears like we said, directly in the middle of the band. See, this is two to negative two, that describes the continuum here. So the BIC is just right in the middle of the band. Uh, and there are two other eigenvalues, z plus and z minus, uh, which are given plus minus of this formula. And uh, so in the, there are two cases to consider. For g greater than 1, these two solutions are bound states. For g less than 1, 
They are virtual bound states, uh, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, so in the case g greater than 1, we note uh, the presence of these bound states will tend to kind of get in the way of what we're interested in, uh, because this will, this will tend to suppress the non-exponential dynamics uh, and make it, make it more difficult to see. However, in this case, in this case for g less than 1, we notice uh, the only thing present in the spectrum is the bound state and continuum and two virtual bound states. That means there are no additional bound states, there are no additional resonances. And that means there's nothing in the, in the evolution except for n pure non-exponential decay. So this gives a good opportunity to study the effect. Um, oh, and one other point. Uh, one other point, which is the, the gap between these states and the band edge will be an important physical quantity. And notice that the gap vanishes here at the delocal, at the localization transition between the two regions. So we'll look at that case in a moment. So as we, as we said, the IC eigenstate is given here in the simple expression. So then we are going to study the time evolution of the simplest orthogonal state, uh, which is defined here. So we'll call this psi orthogonal. Uh, clearly, it's orthogonal to this. And we're going to look at the survival probability here, which is written in terms of the survival amplitude, A orthogonal here. Um, and uh, the probability is then the modulus squared. Okay. So now for the G greater than 1 case, uh, for the G greater than 1 case, what we find is uh, for, uh, for uh, A orthogonal, we find that um, we find this term, which is the combined influence of the two uh, bound states in this g greater than one case, as well as a what I'll call a branch point, and that is that's the influence from the continuum, okay, uh, the direct influence from the continuum, uh, which is this term contains all the non-exponential dynamics. Okay. So that's the bound state. That's the non-exponential dynamics. And so in this case, I choose as an example g equal 1.1. So we're in this, this side of the transition. And what we find is in the linear scale, we can see, yeah, the, the, the system just sort of uh, bottoms out. The, the decay just bottoms out at this bound state here. And in the log-log scale, you can see a little better. Uh, basically, you have, for a very short time, you have some non-exponential dynamics, but it's quickly replaced by the bound state uh, of influence here. You know, and you can also, obviously, you can see the, the oscillations here, uh, which is just like the Rabi effect from the two, the two bound states. Uh, yeah, and so now let's turn to our primary interest, which is the g less than or equal to 1 case. Um, and here, the non-exponential dynamics are the only thing because these bound states have vanished. And uh, so in this case here, I've written this... Uh, this uh, branch point contribution for the survival amplitude is written here. It's written as an integral over this uh, branch cut, which this just represents the, the continuum, z squared minus 4. Remember, it extends from minus 2 to plus 2. And uh, it also in the denominator appears the, uh, the virtual bound states, z plus and z minus. And the contour is just written as an integration over the branch cut. And uh, yeah, and so these virtual states. And uh, now we can deform the contour. We can deform the contour uh, as, uh, by, by dragging the contour out to infinity in the lower half plane, as is often done with these kind of problems. And when we do, uh, we have, we've written the branch point effect in terms of two contributions, A plus and A minus, where uh, A minus is from the lower uh, the lower uh, um, branch point, and A plus is the upper branch point. And, um, yeah, sorry, some things have rendered improperly here. That's kind of why I wanted to use my own computer, but anyway. Uh, just ignore these M's. That one is supposed to be like a plus, I think, or a minus. Uh, yeah. So, but anyway, this is a, a polynomial in S over T in the denominator, and um, 
oh yeah, this is plus minus, that's what's going on, this is plus minus. And uh, so, um, yeah, and so in this lowest order term, delta G, delta G is just, it is the gap between the virtual bound state and its respective nearest band edge, okay, in the two contributions, plus minus here. Um, yeah, so gap plays an important role in the dynamics, as we'll see here. So there are two key time zones for the problem. So uh, there is a, a relatively intermediate time scale, which we will call the inverse Powerball near zone. And in this case, this middle term dominates the evolution, and we can uh, approximate out the others. And so in this case, we find an evolution that looks like this. It's a 1 over t effect, and, uh, and it appears in this intermediate time zone between the Zeno dynamics and this longer time scale t delta. Okay, And then on the longest time scales, or the asymptotic time scales, uh, we have the inverse power law far zone. So in that case, we find the 1 over t cubed dynamics that I mentioned earlier. Um, and notice the time scale separating these two regions, t delta, it is proportional to 1 over delta g, the, this gap between the virtual state and its nearest uh, band edge. Okay, so what that means is in this special case at the localization transition, remember the gap closes when a bound state becomes a virtual bound state or vice versa. In that case, delta G vanishes and T delta goes to infinity and the near zone dynamics control the full evolution. Okay. Finally, one other point is notice there are oscillations in these two. That's because we're in the middle of the band edge. So this is just the coherence between the, the two contributions from the two band edges. And uh, notice there is a phase shift of pi over 2 between the two. So we can see that all this, we can see all this for the case g equals 0 0.9 here. So we are below this transition. Uh, we are below the transition uh, so that this gap is not equal to 0. Uh, and we can see both the near zone and far zone dynamics. So we can see 1 over t at, sh at relatively shorter times. And then at long times, we see the 1 over t cubed effect. Okay. And further, we can see we can see the pi over two phase shift between between the two regions. So everything matches with our expectation. Next, for the g equal one case, uh, we're directly at this localization transition. Uh, in this case, as we said earlier, this uh, this gap vanishes and this time scale diverges. So we only have the near zone dynamics, uh, even asymptotically. And so in this paper, in this paper, uh, there's more details about the virtual state and the relation to the non-exponential dynamics in this, this kind of picture. Uh, so now, to bring our analysis a little closer to experiment, we consider the following two issues. The first issue, in a real experiment, it's actually quite difficult to tune the parameters of the system directly to the BIC. Uh, so, for that reason, we consider a very small value of epsilon d, right? And so there's, in this case, the BIC becomes a resonance with just an extremely narrow uh, decay width, okay? The imaginary eigenvalue is non-zero, but very small. Another point is that it may be, you know, preparing, preparing the state psi orthogonal seems, uh, seems feasible, but it may be difficult to measure the output state psi orthogonal with this fixed phase uh, on it. Uh, so for that reason, uh, we consider the quantities that are just measured at the, at the end, that are just measured at the D site and the one site. Uh, and in particular, we consider the, we find it convenient to study P1D, which is just the two contributions added together. It's convenient because actually for epsilon D equals zero, it reduces exactly to P orthogonal. So now, uh, Let's look at the BIC detuning first. So in this case, we get a, a small imaginary part to the eigenvalue, and uh, it actually can be shown to be squared in epsilon d, uh, the, which is the small quantity. And uh, we can estimate the impact of the resonance uh, from just taking the pole. In this case, you can show that both lowest order and next lowest orders cancel out uh, in this contribution. So it actually turns out to be at, uh, fourth order in epsilon d, and it turns out to be extremely small to the point of basically being completely negligible. 
So we find that our, that our, uh, our technique is really quite robust against detuning. Uh, now for the next issue, which is we consider this uh, kind of more realistic uh, measurement at the end of the process, um, we, find that, uh, we find that P1D is essentially the same as P orthogonal for much of the evolution. The only real difference is that uh, the resonance effect is only suppressed to lowest order, not next lowest order. So in this case, it, it appears at uh, order epsilon d squared. So it has more influence on the dynamics in that region. Um, so now, uh, now we look at the case of uh, the impact of small detuning. So for this case, the difference between the two quantities, uh, p orthogonal, the original quantity, is the red curve, and p1d is the is the next is the new quantity, uh, the more realistic quantity in the blue. Uh, we find the difference between the two quantities does not appear until relatively late times. Uh, in fact, the resonance has no noticeable impact on p orthogonal, uh, which is not surprising given it's like a 10 to the minus 12 uh, effect. Uh, however, the resonance does eventually have influence on the blue quantity, uh, which is just a little above 10 to the minus 6. Uh, which is right where it appears here. Uh, then for larger detuning, the difference between the two appears only in the short-lived exponential regime. Basically what we have is you have, you have, uh, you have uh, the re the re for the blue curve, the resonance, the exponential decay is kind of just replacing a part of the near zone dynamics. Uh, so uh, there's still no resonance impact on P orthogonal, even for large detuning. Uh, P1D also exhibits an interesting pre-exponential inverse power law decay, which is unusual. Um, and finally, the two quantities agree again in the 1 over T cubed R zone. And uh, so with that having been said, uh, we show our conclusion. So. Uh, we've shown that populating the BIC orthogonal state provides an interesting opportunity to study the deviations from exponential decay. Um, and we showed a case where we can actually get fully non-exponential dynamics. Uh, we observed the, 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 the transition from a near zone dynamics to a far zone dynamics, as well as coherent oscillations in the case of the bound state in the middle of the band with the pi over 2 phase shift between the two zones. And we also saw that, saw that our method is really quite robust against the BIC detuning. Um, yeah, so thank you. Oops. Questions or remarks? Marco Robnick. There's an old paper by Marco Robnick from uh, 1984 or so, where he a very simple example of a bound state in the continuum where um, you have uh, a, 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 a potential as in, with infinite walls in Y, and in X there's a finite potential well. And he proves there's a bound state in the continuum. Now, is that too simple to show the effects that you describe? Or, I mean, it's a it's very oh, straightforward well, if calculation. It's, if it's infinite walls on both sides, it sounds like it would be a closed system instead of an open. No, no, it's closed in X, but in Y, but not in X. Oh, okay. So it's, it's, it's two walls in Y, but in X it's open, and there's a little potential oh, well in the middle. I and uh, it's, and the point of him describing it was twofold. First of all, that uh, it's a separable system, so you can calculate everything exactly. But it also, it's very vulnerable to perturbation, because what he shows is that the um, uh, the bound state disappears if the two walls are made diverging, and if they converge, which means it's really a bound system, then they, it becomes a pure point spectrum. Right, right. But I'm just wondering if the case, the idealized case, which really has a bound state, if that would have the, if you would excite it somehow, and I didn't quite follow, um, whether you would get the non-exponential decays that you describe. It sounds like the answer is yes. I'd because have if, to it is, if it is, it would be a really but simple case to calculate. To, you'd have to be able to write, you'd have to be able to write the BIC state exactly yeah. so that you could well, you can. write the orthogonal state. Well, you can. And then, yeah, then it should be possible. I'll, I'll show you the paper. Okay, yeah, I'd really be interested. There's also a, an old paper, probably it, it repeats what 
the papers you, you cite, but by uh, Asher Perez with the title Non-Exponential Decay Law, just that. Okay. And I thought that was quite a well-known paper from 1980 or so. I don't, I don't know. There are quite, there are quite a few that are I'm sure sort of there is. It the may be that people discover the same things, but okay. I mean, I'll find it. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. It's not a question, but a comment, because there was a wonderful paper by Girardi, Rimini, and Fionda in, I think, early 70s, which alluded to your uh, rightly point out, pointed out uh, stuff, you know, when for very short times, there's a power law and, and very, very uh, exponentially long, I mean, uh, asymptotically long times also, a uh, power law. And uh, wonderfully, you know, this translates into the uncertainty time energy uncertainty being uh, reformulated in the sense, let me be very brief, of course, uh, you know, we know that time and Hamiltonian, uh, time is not an operator, of course, it just flows by, but if you thrust the canonical conjugacy into them, then it turns out that for most systems, I mean, that of interest, Hamiltonian has a lower bound, time just flows from minus plus infinity, and this brings in incompatibility and hence the uncertainty in, uh, relation can be, uh, has to be modified, okay? Just, uh, I'm reminded of that because of the, one of the consequences of the, uh, you know, the non-reciprocity of H and T. Anyway, thank you. Okay, yeah, that might be interesting to look at. Okay, more comments or questions? One more hand. I don't see any. Okay, if not, let's thank Savannah again. Thank you.